Okay, so we're going to move to our next section, uh, which is erosion control, sediment control, and slopes, uh, slope stabilization. So we're going to have the same kind of format. We're going to start with our presenter, uh, Pete Robichaud. He's a research engineer at the US Forest Service. And um, I'm gonna leave the floor for Pete, uh, for him and his presentation. Hi, Pete, welcome. Hello, everyone, and uh, hopefully you can hear me. I am calling in from Moscow, Idaho, where this morning's uh, air temperature was eight degrees Fahrenheit, just in case you're curious what it's like up here. So today I am going to focus on Southern California uh, for all of you down there where it's nice and warm. And I'm going to talk about post-fire erosion and a lot about some rehabilitation or erosion control treatments and some data that we've collected down there to show you how well things work. So I'm gonna start off with a little video of the 2003 old Grand Prix fire uh, that was outside of Devore, California. Uh, maybe some of you might remember that fire. Uh, anyway, when the, after that fire occurred, the Bear team created a burn severity map that you can see in the image. When you look up at the hill slopes, you can see this uh, particular watershed. It was about a 200 acre watershed and it was above a, above a subdivision. So the recommendation was to apply some straw mulch in about half of that watershed, the lower half of the watershed. They did that with, uh, I believe with a uh, helicopter. And, but after, right after they applied the straw mulch, they had some big winds, the Santa Ana winds, and it blew the straw mulch. And so it didn't stay where they wanted it to stay. And that caused some issues. Uh, it ended up around the stobs of the chaparral plants and not uniformly spread. Then on December 24th and December 25th, they had a rain event. The bars show you the rainfall amount in an hourly basis. So, you know, two tenths to four tenths of an inch in an hour. And then the red line, uh, the blue line is the cumulative. So cumulative about four inches over this uh, 24 hour period, which is quite a bit of rain for that area. And that the intensity increased as the storm went through. Well, that increase caused some things to happen. So this video might be a little choppy for you, but I think you get the gist of it that down Greenwood Avenue in DeVore, we had material moving down there like that big boulder in the back on the left is probably two and a half, three feet diameter. So what we know is that after these fire events, things can, can happen. And when things, when things happen, we make sure we need to understand what could be the effect of that thing happening downstream. So uh, Jamie covered pretty well the bear process, burned air emergency response process. I am not going to cover that, but it's like a six step process that we use to evaluate um, the burn severity uh, with a satellite imagery. We go to the field, we measure things, we create a burn severity map. We look at values at risk. We then uh, focus a little bit on uh, what the landscape response is. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. And then lastly is treatments. And I'm gonna talk, spend some time talking about treatments. So the bear process well-established now and pretty uniform across the country. Matter of fact, it's the same process that's used overseas in Australia, in Canada, in Greece, Portugal, they're all using a very similar process to what we do here in the United States. They've all learned from what we've been doing. What I wanted to focus on a little bit is just on the landscape change and how do you determine what the, that response is going to be. So we have uh, erosion prediction tools. Uh, the Forest Service, uh, have, we work with the WEP model, the Water Erosion Prediction Project. And so we have a suite of interfaces to the wet model that people can use to help them identify post-fire risks. Uh, the, the wet model can be run in a hill slope uh, version as well as a watershed version. When we run the hill slope version, you can then actually look at some 
uh, treatment options you might put on the hill slope and see what we predict would be the benefit of those hill slope treatments. At the watershed version, uh, you can uh, look at what that watershed response is going to be. Let's say there's a culvert for a road you're wondering if it's going to be able to pass the peak flow through. Well, we can run the model to look at what those peak flow estimates might be. So with that in mind, uh, I, our latest interface that we've developed is called the WEP Cloud. And we went to this because our, the WEP model was on our server. And we found that during busy fire seasons where there are a lot of bear teams out and, and other agencies who are interested in post-fire response, that our server was bogging down by the, the usage. So by going to a cloud computing environment, hey, guess what, we eliminated that problem. The way that the model works, and I'm not gonna go into the details of that today, but just briefly, is that you upload a soil burn severity map for an area. You pick out a few other uh, things that we require. Uh, the model will put in like the expected, uh, where the channels are located. Uh, it tells you something about each of the different hill slopes that go out of that channel. So in this particular example, there's a culvert here that I might have an interest in off of this road. And I wanna know if, I, if I'm gonna, exceed the capacity of that culvert. So I set up the model and then I can do some runs and I have various outputs. But let's say if I want to just look at the uh, peak flow discharge, uh, here it is in cubic feet per second. So 600 uh, CFS on a two year return interval event and maybe 900 to 1000 CFS for five years. So it gives me a way to quickly evaluate that capacity of that culvert, whether it's going to meet that or exceed that capacity. The other thing that we can do is when we run the web cloud model, we can download the input files we need for ERMIT. ERMIT is a probabilistic hill slope tool that we can compare uh, different treatments to see how well they would reduce the impact of that erosion. So we use ERMIT, erosion risk management tool in a batch processor to do that. What that provides us is an opportunity to look at uh, if we do some treatments on some hill slopes. So in this case here, uh, this happens to be a Colorado fire, just for an example, 10% um, probability that I might get 12 tons if I don't do any treatment. If I put some mulch out there, I'm going to reduce that down to maybe about three tons uh, per acre. Uh, the batch processor has lots of options for the users to be able to look and identify the risks and uh, sort out what treatments they wanna look at and different ways to evaluate how well those treatments are going to work. We even have a cost benefit tool, the VAR tool, which puts an economic number a value to the, the values at risk downstream and the treatment cost to see if it pencils out that you should do something to try to reduce that risk. Well, the rest of my talk, I'm gonna focus on treatments. Let's just say we are gonna do something out there to reduce that risk because we have something of high value downstream. On the hill slope, these are kind of the like six choices of treatments that we have. So we'll walk through those one by one. Uh, aerial seeding, it, uh, it is great when it, after it gets established, but you need a growing season or two to get it established. So it's very inexpensive to put the aerial uh, seed out there with a fixed wing or a helicopter, but at its effectiveness on reducing erosion really depends on the rainfall and the distribution of that rainfall. So in a review of some of the studies throughout the West, one out of eight studies show a reduction in erosion in the first year and two out of eight in the, uh, in the second year. So that means in that first year, seven of the studies did not reduce the erosion because the, the, the seeding hadn't established well enough. The roots weren't long enough. There wasn't enough cover out there. So it's an important thing to remember if we uh, prescribe that treatment, you gotta make sure you have good rainfall. Agricultural straw, Great choice of a treatment, provides immediate cover. You know, we always need like 60, 70% cover on the hill slope to actually reduce that amount of erosion that we're going to get. I mentioned that wind displacement issue they had on the uh, Grand Prix old fire. So if you're in a windy environment, maybe we might want to think of some of the wood products that I'll talk about. 
And then you have to also pay attention to any invasives, whether it be wheat straw or rice straw, to make sure there aren't any invasive species uh, that you're going to be putting on the landscape. The other next treatment is a wood treatment. Uh, there's wood straw and wood shreds. Uh, wood straw is a, a commercial product that you can purchase. Uh, Forest Concept is the name of the company who produces that. And they used waste from the plywood making industry. And they cut up the pieces of wood that are left over from making plywood and they, we can use that as a mulch. Alternatively, when there is a, a forest that's burned, we can use a tub grinder and grind up burnt trees and then use that as a mulch and apply that to the hills, hillside. And it's much more stable in a windy environment, but it costs a lot more to put this treatment out there. Hydro mulch has been used and not as so much anymore. And the, the reason why is that um, although it provides great cover, as you can see in those pictures, uh, it breaks down very rapidly. You know, they use the filler for that, they use either paper or a wood, proce uh, wood product but they're really short fiber lengths. So if they have short fiber lengths, uh, guess what? They break down quickly with UV uh, uh, processes, et cetera. So although it, it works well in the very short term, longer term doesn't last very long, so it may not be the best choice. Contrafel logs. In the 1980s and 1990s, contrafel logs was the treatment of choice uh, throughout the, uh, the Forest Service and other land man management agencies but its use has declined quite a bit because we've done a lot of studies on effectiveness and they work really well for small storms, but the larger storms, they didn't work very well. The reason being is that they overtop, they undermine or the water goes around the edges of the contrafell logs. And we've had uh, several studies out there that talk about the effectiveness, including the mixing fire uh, in the LA basin back in the, I think the late 90s, I think, was that fire. So here's the comparison of all the different treatments that I just talked about in the price range. So you have to think about the price of these things, the value at risk to determine, if, is it a good choice, a good investment of funds to pick a particular treatment to try to reduce the impact of that erosion? Road treatments is another uh, avenue that, that we often use after, after fires. Um, we might be armoring the intakes of a culvert. We might be adding cover over the cut slope and fill slope of a road. We might change the size of the, of the pipes for a culvert. And we might be adding rolling dips. All of these are treatments that uh, the bear team uh, evaluate or can use to, to uh, improve the, the road structure to make sure we don't remove that road structure due, due to a, a rain event. And channel treatments, uh, trash racks and straw bales are the straw bale check dams are the two most common uh, treatments. And uh, trash racks themselves, they do redu uh, trap up the uh, debris and, and sediment that comes down the larger boulders to make the water easier to pass down through some other um, infrastructure that it might need to go through a culvert as an example or under a bridge or whatever. The straw bale check dams, we've done some studies on the effectiveness of straw bale check dams, and they work well in some cases, not in every case. The reason being is um, if one of them fails, it's usually catastrophic. If one of these dams uh, pulls out, the next one downstream is probably going to get uh, uh, damaged, and then the next one downstream is going to get damaged, and it continues that way down the hill slope. So if they're going to use this treatment, they have to be sure they're anchored very well. And we use wooden stakes typically to anchor them. We put some rocks on the downstream side to prevent undercutting of the straw bale. And one of the things that we've learned is that if you, if the substrate that you're banging the stake into is not very sturdy, let's say it's an alluvial fan, well, that can move pretty easily with, with water and, and um, as it gets saturated. So then the, the, the dam will fail, but if the substrate is more stable, then there's a better chance it will uh, stay in place. So I thought I'd give you a couple of results of three fires, um, the 2007 Santiago, uh, the Gap Fire, and the Hesacita Fire in Southern California, where we compared some treatments. So all of these graphs, I'll go through them, 
but I'm not going to go into the details of how we collected the data. You're just going to take my word for it that we used uh, good scientific uh, methods to, to measure hill slope erosion. Okay, on this graph, on the, um, on the very top here, the black and the white is our rainfall information. So on the bottom of the axis is clean out dates. So these are the rainfall that have corresponded to those clean out dates. The black bar is the rainfall intensity for a 10 minute period. So we call it max I-10 inches per hour. And that's with the secondary Y axis over on the right hand side of that graph. So rainfall intensity is uh, one to two inches per hour. Okay, and then the white bar is the total precipitation for that event. And so we're seeing about two inches per hour, uh, excuse me, about two inches total rainfall for those events. Now on the bottom of the graph, the, the yellow and the red are the uh, treatments. So the first one that first bar we see is the control with no treatment. Next to that is a um, hydromulch. In this case, you see it wasn't installed yet. And then we have the two red. The red with the hatch is the control. The red without the hatch is the hydromulch. So we're looking at a hydromulch um, effectiveness. And this is sediment yield tons per acre. So here's my control. So at 17 tons per acre in this storm in June, high intensity, look, look at that black bar at the very top, well over two inches per hour. So, and, and then here's the treatment. So the treatment was effective in that particular storm. Now go over to December and I see that my, my um, treated area had more sediment than my control, okay? Remember I mentioned that they break down a bit after a while? Okay, so here's some of that mulch uh, breaking down. Then over here on, in January, um, we see that same case again. The high elevation sites, which are the red bars, we actually had a, a different effect, but we had different rain gauges and the rainfall at the higher elevations, for whatever reason, wasn't as great as it was at the lower elevations. So they didn't get tested as much. But the bottom line, it shows that the hydromelts was effective in a few of these storms, but it had a lower rainfall intensity. Let's go to the Gap Fire in 2008, Santa Barbara uh, uh, County. Same kind of idea, except that this graph is on an annual basis. So uh, rainfall intensity in black, the gray is the total rainfall for that year using the secondary y-axis. So the first year we had 18 inches, 36 inches, and then almost 50 inches of rain in Santa Barbara. Remember, that's that west, uh, wet coastal climate right outside of Santa, Santa Barbara, that moisture coming in off the ocean. So our treatments in this case were a a wood shred. So here's my control of wood shred. And then here's the treatment of the wood shred. So we can see that the wood reduced it about half, six to three. Uh, and then we had a hydromulch here, and we see that also reduced the erosion. So hydromulch in this case shows that it worked. And this is in year one, year two, and year three, pretty much um, uh, pretty effective, right? But we don't have a very high intensity rainfall so that means that with low rainfall intensity and lots of precip, look at the look how much rain came in the second year. Vegetation regrowth was probably pretty good. Oh, well, let, we'll take a look at that in just a second. You'll see that the vegetation regrowth was pretty good for these cases. The last fire is the Hesacita uh, fire on the Los Padres National Forest. Here I am back on a storm by storm basis. The black bar is the rainfall intensity. So these storms about one inch per hour and total precip for these events around two inches. So in this case, we wanted to compare, here's my control, the first bar. The second one is the hydromulch. The third red bar is wood straw at 30%. And then the fourth one is the wood straw at 60%. And I already mentioned that you need about 60, 70% cover to make a difference in erosion. Well, this just kind of verifies that. When we put the, the, the wood straw out at 30%, it's about the same as the control. So it didn't really bias very much, okay? Here's the hydromulch showing a, a reduction in that erosion, right? And then here's my 30% and my 60% uh, cover of that wood uh, straw. So, 
let's take a look at what the ground cover looks like on these fires. I'm just going to show you one for an example. So when we look at ground cover, we're measuring what we what is actually covering the bare soil. Right? So here's our hydromolts, and the yellow bar is the actual treatment of the hydromolts. Then we have a little bit of litter and wood, and then we have the vegetation recovery. Okay? So here's the hydromolts, 90% cover right after we apply it, 60% wood, 30% wood straw, and here's my control. So you can see how that we have very little cover immediately afterwards. But that's in November. By March, hey, look, we're at 40% cover. And then by May, we're over 60% cover. So that cover makes a difference in the reduction in erosion that we see over time. And the fact that we have uh, some of those gentle rains in a lot of those uh, cases I showed you indicates that that vegetation recovery helps reduce that erosion. Okay, so with that, I'm gonna just review what I covered today. I talked a little bit about that bear process. I talked about some of our latest tools for modeling that response. And our tools work just as well in Southern California as they do here in North Idaho. We talked about some treatment considerations. Uh, the mulches seem to be our, are our best bet on trying to reduce the impact of uh, hill slope erosion. And then in Southern California, I gave you a little bit of detail of some studies we've done down there. So those of you who are, are sharp will take a picture of, the, of this screen right here and has the web address where you can download all of these publications. They're all freely available on our website. So with that, I'll um, turn it back over to you guys. Thank you for your attention and hopefully you got something out of this. Thank you so much, Pete. All right, um, before we go into the questions, if you have any uh, questions, please make sure you put them in the Q&A box. And uh, we're gonna pass it to our panelists and then we'll have time at the end for answering all the questions. So I'll be introducing our panelists now. We have Rich Casale, he's Pulse Fire Restoration Specialist at the NRCS. And Valerie Carrillo Sara, She's a LA Regional Water Quality Control Board, a member of the board. So um, with that, I'm going to let uh, Rich and Valerie take the floor and um, do their introduction and uh, presentations. I have Richard, you're muted. Yeah. How about now? Yes. Okay. Yes. Hello, everyone. Good morning. It's really nice for me to be with you this morning. I'm on travel, so bear with me with uh, maybe the, the video. But um, I am um, a certified professional erosion and sediment control specialist uh, and have been for over 40 years. I'm also a post fire restoration specialist. Uh, working currently as a contractor for the USDA Natural Resource Conservation Service, an agency I worked for for nearly 45 years um, in California, mostly around the Monterey and San Francisco Bay areas. Um, I have ex extensive experience um, on a couple of dozen fires, maybe more over the course of my career throughout California. Um, doing post-fire restoration on private properties. Um, so more recently, uh, since I retired five years ago, I've worked on many of the California wildfires from the wine country to Southern California, um, Big Sur, Santa Barbara, Montecito, Debris Flow, um, and wine country, what have you. At any rate, um, I've learned a lot from being out there boots on the ground over my career. And what I have found um, is a lot of well-intended uh, folks trying to do the right thing or to follow whatever the protocols are for post-fire from various different agencies. But one thing I, I, I see common is that um, the advice that's given is kind of like one size fits all. Like you take information and you can apply it universally. 
And I found that it's really important that each site is, is unique. Um, and if you get carried away by one size fits all, you find people just um, uh, doing what their neighbor is doing um, or applying the same technology to every situation. And that can have disastrous results. So a thorough uh, investigation, uh, assessment of the situation on properties, whether they're large properties or even on a watershed scale is, needs to be uh, done first before anything is applied, whether it's seeding or straw or uh, any of the other things that, that Pete, Pete mentioned. Some of these things can work in reverse rather than forward. My first go-to um, best management practice is nature. Working with nature um, comes first. Understanding the natural processes that are in place, work with her, not against her, and um, make sure that, um, that anything that does get installed on the landscape gets maintained. It's not just put there and left there by itself. It needs work and it needs uh, maintenance and needs to be monitored. Um, additionally, I think that following fire, people are almost too quick to act and, um, and oftentimes they're taken advantage by maybe contractors that are well-intended, maybe not, some, not so much so. So getting good information up front, um, working with local resource conservation districts, UCCE, um, the Natural Resources Conservation Service, to try and get some good non-biased um, information and advice is, should be a first step. Um, anytime you know, we're uh, providing uh, advice to, to fire victims, um, local communities, uh, you know, units of government, what have you, as resource managers, you, we have to keep in mind that folks um, have lost a lot and um, it's, it's expensive to put a lot of these measures on the landscape and um, they may not work at all, as I, as I mentioned, but the ones that um, do, um, you know, uh, we wanna make sure that their money is well spent because they don't have a lot of leftover money for expensive erosion control. And insurances are all over the map in terms of what insurance companies will, will cover in the way of post-fire restoration. But getting back to nature, um, nature is a lot more resilient than we, we give her credit for. I always say when you control water, you control nature, and that almost never ends well. So some of the practices that do that include such things as water bars and rolling dips and culverting. But saying that, a lot of drainage systems are also interrupted on the post-fire landscape and they need to be attended to because a lot of the erosion issues arise from roadways and road drainage systems and home and property drainage systems. So a careful evaluation of point sources of potential gullies and debris flow activities should be, should be made. The open landscape, the wildlands really need very little care and disturbance. The less disturbance, the better. We need to give plant regeneration and natural reseeding from native seed bank that's already in the, in the soil is, is much time as, as possible. And, um, and uh, protect and knowing how hot the fire burns helps us determine, you know, what is needed or what is not needed. Because a lot of times what we see burned on the landscape isn't, isn't dead. The root systems are still intact. Plants are gonna either re-sprout from those root systems or some part of the plant, there's still coverage on the ground. As Soon as we walk over that landscape, make any disturbance, even to put straw mulch on it, we're disturbing, we're disturbing the soil. We disturb the soil, it makes it more susceptible to erosion and, uh, and, and runoff. So um, I say tread, tread lightly, um, uh, be careful with a lot of the, higher tech kind of erosion control measures. Um, I, I'm always amazed when I see people still using black plastic on hillside slopes. Uh, on the Malibu fires in 1993, one property owner covered 10 acres of their property with black plastic. 
Um, so uh, it's not even a temporary protection. We have to be very careful with emergency and temporary measures because they only give property owners a false sense of security and they can set the stage for creating uh, worse problems or problems for your, for your neighbor. So that's not a good practice. As well as some of the erosion control blankets, the jute netting is almost always installed improperly. Um, and never uh, in conjunction with, with straw mulch that's placed underneath it. Um, those straw wattles can be a good practice, but they're also one of the worst practices, one of the practices that I see installed incorrectly as well. The straw bale dikes, um, and that's not a practice that NRCS recommends anymore because they, as Pete said, they can get installed uh, improperly, and if one goes, they all, they all go, and they're very temporary with a high risk failure. We have to be very careful with high risk failure practices. Sometimes we have to be more prepared with sediment uh, control and management than trying to stop all erosion, um, you know, after a fire. Some of this is going to go on anyway, regardless if there was a fire or not. We can have debris flows without fire. The Santa Cruz Mountains after the 82 storm disaster um, had over 10,000 debris flows and landslides and there was no fire previous of that event. Saying that fires um, do increase the likelihood of debris flow. So we, we do have to uh, evaluate and assess um, watersheds for, for those occurrences. Um, I'm not quite sure I'm doing on time here, but I know we only have 15 minutes total right left in the session um yeah uh, that we have um, yeah a little bit less than 15 but we still need to give valerie some time and questions right, right. are are there's going to be time for questions afterwards or during the presentation so those 15 minutes include or 14 right now include the questions so okay maybe we, if you can i may have up. given i may have given enough of an overview view or where you know where I'm I'm coming from, but I did provide a couple of handouts um, to you, Annika, that could be shared with um, those that are on, on today regarding some things to to certainly keep in mind what some of the best practices are uh, for for the landscape following fire and what some of the most misused practices are that can actually make situations worse. Um, but at any rate. Um, I want to leave enough time for the next the next speaker and any questions that folks might have. Thank you, Richard. Yeah. Um, yeah, let's um, leave the floor for Valerie. Hi, I don't have a presentation today, but um, I, I'm really happy to see everyone here. Um, I've been with the regional board for 22 years. Um, I work in the 401 water quality certification program. Um, been working in environmental permitting. And so I'm kind of following up on what the two previous presenters have been saying in terms of what's really important is that um, planning is a big part of this and proper project design. And in our role, I, I work very closely with um, Army Corps Fish and Wildlife, and we are often, you know, looking at emergency situations. And I'm the one that gets called when, you know, we have hot ash out here near Elizabeth Lake Elizabeth. Valerie, get out here, help us figure out what we're going to do with all this ash, and you know, what are some things we can do to quickly fix some roads. And it's it's always very reactive. And so I have that role dealing with the emergency stuff, but then I also have the preventative stuff with LA County, Ventura County, dealing with flood control because we know these things are gonna happen. And then we have new developments coming online and we have you know, a lot of public um, input about fire situations and what are we gonna do and why are we allowing more housing? So the answer to all of this is better planning and better understanding of what the environment is giving us and it's terrifying. I've seen houses filled with mud, it's terrifying. And I've been on hot ash and I've been out with the fire department right after these fires. And um, it's it's pretty much comes down to, you know, having all of these people um, not understanding their own environment and their own neighborhoods. And I, I can't remember which presenter brought up the, 
you know, about the, the better um, land planning and how that makes such a big difference when people actually understand what, what they're living with, as well as better maintenance in these systems. Because if you have better maintenance going on in the region, um, that'll help, especially with some of these, these debris problems. Um, and also the new in my lifetime, I've seen um, under the Getty Center, they used um, something that was called, a, it's like a silver, it's like silver rings, um, like a metal rings, and it's a barrier. And um, the Getty Center, along with um, City of Los Angeles, wanted to, to put this in an area where they were worried that some debris might come down and flood some some homes and there was a lot of controversy about it. And I thought, well, why don't we give this a chance and let it, you know, let, let us see how this works as a pilot project. Um, Fish and Wildlife was, was um, a little bit upset because they thought, well, this could be a wildlife barrier. But the intent was for let the debris come through, hold back the material, I mean, let the water come through hold the debris back. And so I had to be there and kind of just explain to the other agencies that we need to at least try something to see if it might work and test it out. You know, yes, we've never seen this. This is used for avalanches and I've never seen something like this in my entire life, but let's check it out and let's see how it works. And so the, the argument about um, wildlife passage my explanation was, well, if the thing fills up with debris, it obviously needs to be maintained and who's going to worry about that? And I'll worry about that later. But a deer can walk over this, you know? Um, yeah, the the animals are already impacted and they'll have to figure out a way. And I, I could never in this role be 100% pro-development and 100% pro-environmentalist. I have to see what's the best fit for this, this project. And, and as Rich was saying, Richard was saying, it needs to be site specific and you need to see, you know, what's, what's really um, going on with each particular project. So um, I'm just going to summarize that you know, I'm really happy to see everyone here. I I feel like I'm always in this like little bubble by myself, you know, heading to every little crazy project. And um, if anyone ever wants to team up or needs help with project design and wants to team up with our agencies in our region, feel free to reach out because um, it's really an interesting field. And I'm so glad we're starting to talk more about this now. So, I think that's it. Thank you, Valerie. Appreciate it. All right. Thank you, all three of our presenters and panelists. And um, we're going to open the, the room for a Q&A. So I see that some, some people already posted some questions that were answered um, directly in the Q&A. But if anybody else has questions, now is the time. We still have about five minutes to, to address those. Annika, can I give my um, email address in case um, I don't get questions or information? I think people can email me. And I have tons of information that I've developed on post-fire restoration for NRCS and also yes. as, a private, as a private consultant. So it's Rich Cassell, C-A-S-A-L-E, the number three at gmail.com. Uh, yes, and if if the if the attendees will open up the QA box, uh, Rich has also answered a question by Conrad Kiernan. Uh, with with that email typed as well, if, if you want to just copy and paste that. Perfect. Thank you. Oh, um, Ellen Walton has a question. Uh, I, she asks, how I did the reads it. work so far? Um, you know, I'm so busy with permitting everything in LA and Ventura County that I haven't had a chance to go look at it, but I'm going to after this discussion. Um, I think they're probably working just fine because I haven't heard anything about it. And if they didn't work, I would have heard about it. So um, what needs to probably happen now is some maintenance on whatever's behind those rings. Um, and so and there was some promises about, you know, these, this is a temporary thing. And once the watershed recovers, 
um, because it was a, a valley shape, really steep incised channel with a lot of potential for material to come through. And then the rings were supposed to be set up like a wall kind of that the water could flow through and it was just a, um, to hold the debris back. And then the promise was after the watershed recovers, we'll take all the material out. And the problem in our county is where do you put the material? You're now in, you know, below the Getty Center, where do you take this? And so that's one problem, the maintenance and nobody, everyone wants to forget about that. And you just reminded me. And then the second part is taking the structure out once it's not necessary so that things can recover and the channel can go back to what it wants to be. Um, so I will be checking on that. Aya, do we have time for one more question? Yes, we do. All right, um, Jolene Tam asks, what decisions should land managers make prior to fire events to assist with proper bear response in watersheds? Um, I think that's a, that's, you know, this is coming up with my housing developments that I've been in, stuck in the middle of, um, new housing developments. Um, people need to get more involved in the CEQA process early on, and it's a county planning problem. Um, I, did I say that out loud? Um, it, it's, these, these are discussions that need to be having, they need to be having these in the very, very beginning in the environmental um, review process, because what we're seeing now is now we're more aware of these problems, but then we have 20 year old CEQA documents that we have to legally rely on until someone challenges them in court. So um, I would say that there needs to be more cooperation with the people room with the county agencies who are actually planning new things. And that's where that's where the comments need to be made before new housing is approved and where it's approved and, you know, or if it is approved, where, you know, where should they build smarter within the within the property that they own? People are entitled to, to build, but maybe we should help them build a little bit smarter. Are there any other questions uh, just quickly before we break for lunch? Feel free to drop those in the q and I'd like to ask, ask a question. Um, the um, people were talking about, um, well, especially Richard was talking about um, homeowners making the wrong decisions or, or doing the wrong management practices and um, working with, um, invasive pests myself, I talk about contracting licensed professionals that know what they're doing and get trained and know right. what to do and what not to do. Is there an equivalent in this realm of erosion control of a licensed professional or in where can homeowners and land managers? Yes. You know, there's the certified professional erosion and sediment control specialist, CPESC. You know, and so that that is a certification program, which um, I actually co-founded uh, 40 years ago. Today, there's over 45,000 such professionals in 43 different countries around the world. So there, there, there is a website. You can go to cpesc.org. You can go to EnviroCert, which is the certifying organization. And you can get a list of those folks anywhere in the United in the United States. So that's that's one source. Um, your local natural resource conservation service office or resource conservation district may also have qualified erosion control specials specialists that may not have that certification, but have the experience and the technology at their fingertips. This past year, I developed a manual for NRCS, a 62-page manual for training and for uh, employee development in the area of post-fire restoration and how NRCS will, um, you know, respond, um, you know, in, in that manner uh, following wildfire throughout uh, California. Um, there's, there's an effort to take that manual uh, to the national scale for other states to use. But most of the handouts, videos, slideshows um, that are on the NRCS um, website, I either 
reviewed <laughs> or I wrote or I co-authored. And I also did a manual, um, a booklet for the Native Plant Society called the uh, Fire Recovery Guide. And it's a free colored publication from the California Native Plant Society on erosion control, uh, plant materials and um, processes and um, alternative treatments um, in particularly like wildland areas, but also around people's homes and properties. Because, you know, post fire in this, in this um, environment and in this, in this, um, and, you know, while an interface is, uh, is an opportunity for the future to plant back better than what was there before. I developed with the California Native Plant Society a list of fire resistant, if you will, uh, plant materials and how to keep landscapes more fire resistant, even if you have plants in that landscape that um, typically have a higher fire hazard rating. So there's, there's, the information is out there. It's just being able to share. It's one reason why I'm on board with you today. So uh, again, for folks that are, have a real interest in need in this area, um, let's start uh, an email relationship because I can, I can pass a lot of this information on to you uh, better through that means and, and, and make it site specific. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, so we are in time for our lunch break. Um, thank you. Um, before that, I want to thank uh, all of you, uh, Pete, Rich, and Valerie, for being here today. And um, we'll do a quick break and we'll get together back um, at 12.40. Um, and we'll start our second part of this workshop with revegetation and invasive plant management.